Welcome everyone. I'm Jean Crowther, Principal and New Mobility Group Leader at Also Planning and Design. I'm based here in Portland, Oregon, and we're really excited to kick off this workshop as part of the Urbanism Next 2021 Virtual World Conference. Uh, really uh, getting started uh, with the conference this morning. And for the next two and a half hours, our topic is dancing with disruption, learning how to pivot plans and projects in times of change and uncertainty. And we centered this workshop around four case studies, experiences in four different cities, really because we've seen in the past year an extraordinary opportunity to learn from one another and to take stock of the experimentation that's been playing out in cities uh, for new ways of planning, new ways of designing and launching projects. And really that experimentation has come because the stakes have been so high uh, this last year with multiple layers of uh, crises and events um, across the country. And what we've experienced in the last year with a lot of um, turmoil has come after a period that was already marked with a lot of rapid change and evolution for the mobility and transportation sectors. And it really heading into 2020, it really felt like the stakes were already very high as uh, we were experiencing many new technologies and service models in mobility. And the public sector was already grappling with how to adjust to a new pace of decision-making, how to be more nimble and responsive. And so in the last year, with, with that sense of rapid change already really a part of um, the mobility sector, We've seen that that disruption really faced its own disruption, and there's been more change and even uh, the progress that was being made in um, looking for new and nimble ways to be responsive. So today, we really hope this workshop is an opportunity to take a step back, um, look at what we've experienced in the last year, here are some firsthand stories in particular. Um, we hope today gives you a sense, not just of successes, but also of um, some of the things that didn't work and what cities are still learning. And we also are gonna have the opportunity to hear from Nico Larco at Urbanism Next and David Bragdon from Transit Center on some of the research and data uh, that's been collected in uh, recent months to help us put all of this and these um, case studies into perspective. So I'll be moderating today's workshop and Nick Falbo from Portland Bureau of Transportation, who's gonna be sharing one of our case studies, he'll be helping me facilitate our agenda. We're going to start off with presentations from Nico at Urbanism Next and David. And we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A after they present. We encourage you to submit questions through the chat window. Um, we'll be tracking those and we'll refer back to that when we have time for Q&A. And then we'll shift over to our four case studies. We have Salt Lake City, the city of Charlotte, the city of Portland, and also the city of Oakland, California. Stories from each of those communities um, and really fantastic uh, leaders in mobility who will be sharing their experiences. We'll introduce them um, as we head into that part of the agenda. And then we'll also have a little time at the end to uh, use breakout groups to discuss what you may be experiencing in your own work life um, today and talk about different uh, ways of pivoting uh, through uncertainty and change. Um, and then an opportunity to wrap up um, at the close of today's workshop. So with that, I am going to ask Nico if he can share his screen. Uh, Nico, of course, is the director of Urbanism Next, the University of Oregon, um, and we're excited to have him 
giving us our first. Did did um, did we want to do the poll question, yeah. Jean? Yes. Are we ready to do that? Yeah, I think we can do it. Okay. So Nick, if you're here, I think Nick was going to introduce this. Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Jean, and thank you, everyone, for being here. We want to start out the kind of collaborative conversation uh, here in the chat and using a poll. So we're going to have a, a Zoom poll pop up uh, with a question for you about um, this issue of uncertainty and disruption. Uh, do you have a project or plan that is facing uncertainty? Uh, we want you to tell us about it. Take the poll question and in the chat, uh, give us a little more information. What is the primary disruptor uh, and uncertainty that you're facing right now? Can you all see the polls? Vote away. Are you seeing your results? I see, I see results. Can someone, can someone tell them to me? Because I can't see them on my screen. <laughs> Nico, it looks like 10 people said, yes, so much disruption, help, question mark. 10 additional people said, maybe, not certain about the uncertainty, which I feel myself. And then finally, just two people said, nope, things are fairly crystal clear here. Can I please be whoever you are? <laughs> that wasn't part of it, but I just, I want to be there. <laughs> we should have added that to the, to the description. Thanks, Warren. Um, great. Nick, do you want to say anything else before I get going? No, take it off. Take, take, it, take it on. All right. Uh, so thank you all for being here. It's really exciting to, to have everyone uh, be participating and really exciting for the group that we've gathered uh, to be speaking to everyone. I'm going to share my screen here. And uh, if I can get a verbal confirmation that you can all see this because I cannot see you. Yes. OK, great. So um, as Dean was saying, you know, one of the issues that we've really run into is this whole idea of having to uh, deal with uncertainty. Um, uh, you know, this is not something that I think is new in cities and especially a lot around a lot of the topics that we've talked about um, in Urbanism Next over the years, the, you know, the advent of uh, new mobility, e-commerce, especially, and thinking about what's going to happen with AVs, we're going to be uh, actually seeing a lot of disruption and a lot of uncertainty and how do you function that? Well, COVID has uh, made that very clear to everyone happening right now. So the plans that we had two years ago uh, don't really make a lot, whole lot of sense. Uh, how do we react to that? And, and how, do, how do we work within that? Um, and that's what this is. This session is really about. So I'm going to go through some research that we did in Urbanism Next over the last year on COVID, particularly, and the impacts that we're seeing at that around that. So hopefully, all of you are familiar with the Urbanism Next framework, where we look at the these kind of forces of change, these disruptions: new mobility, AVs, e-commerce, and urban delivery. How it affects land use, urban design, building design, transportation, real estate, and the implications it has for equity, health, and the environment. Um, in this last year, we did this thing, which was, oh my goodness. <laughs> COVID-19 is another form of disruption. How is it that this form of disruption is going to be uh, um, impacting all of these uh, issues that we've been looking at over the last few years? And how, sh how should we, re we be reacting to that? So we did uh, two reports, which are available at urbanismnext.org on the um, uh, impacts of COVID-19. One that really looks at uh, takeaways across multiple sectors. Another one that looks at impacts to the framework specifically um, and, you know, great people at Urbanism Next working on that. Grace led that charge. Um, so I'm going to go through not everything, but just some of the main topics that we were looking at. Um, transportation, there are obviously a whole lot of issues around transportation, uh, uh, retail and restaurants that we saw a lot of changes, and then some uh, economic pieces. This is the way it's uh, the topics that are covered in the, in the report. As I said, I'm not going through everything, but just to give you all a snapshot of where we're at. So one of the biggest disruptions we've seen is work from home. Enormous changes to um, the number of people who are going into the office. In June, it was reported around 42%. That came down. Uh, and these are two different uh, places that, where data was gathered. So there's slightly, can't exactly compare apples to apples here. Uh, but it stayed fairly st stable around a quarter of the, of the office uh, of the population is uh, working from home right now. That changes dramatically when you look at cities. So New York uh, has about 84% of people working from home, not going into the office. So the you know 23% is over the entire country. A lot of the jobs are actually you know in rural areas, or you can't. Um, uh, so really, really strong differences between urban areas and rural areas. Um, slightly related to that as well, and uh, is that there's a lot of people who don't have that option of working from home. A uh, study coming out came out in June, looking at. Uh, uh, positions across the country, and about 50% of people 
do not have the option either they're essential workers or the job just can't be done from a distance. So there's definitely some inequities that exist in this whole even ability to work from home. But also as we think about what's gonna be happening post pandemic, how many people are gonna remain uh, working from home, there is still this, this, um, this shift, this difference. Um, that has translated to a dramatic drop in work-related trips. So, you know, uh, 50%, 40% reduction in the number of work trips that are happening, which means that we're seeing an enormous reduction in peak, right? The, as it turns out, so if we look at overall trips that are happening in the U.S. per week, we're about at 86% of uh, where we were uh, pre-pandemic. Um, so there's a lot of trips that are still happening. The thing is that they're fairly... Uh, uh, distributed along the day. We're not seeing anywhere near the peaks that we've been seeing, the rush hour peaks uh, uh, related to work, which has enormous implications for us in terms of the transportation system. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of changes happening in cycling. Uh, a lot of cities that uh, had some cycling happening all of a sudden saw enormous uh, boosts in that. Houston seeing an, a huge rise, in New York City seeing an enormous rise in uh, bicycle use. The weather's starting to get better uh, throughout the country. We're seeing the, those numbers come up again. Interestingly, cities that have already fairly good uh, cycling networks didn't see a tremendous change. So Portland uh, being one of those cities, but large change in the number of bikes being used and sold uh, um, throughout the country. Um, we're gonna be hearing more about this from David, but enormous drop in subway and in transit ridership. Sorry, uh, this is from the MTA with 26% drop in, of, in, from pre-pandemic levels. That is a really large question of how, how, is that going to continue and how is it going to be affecting the organization, our cities, and how we move around um, uh, as well. Really interesting with this as well is the idea that the the um, the if we if if peak travel, if if uh, you know traffic and congestion is one of the things that actually pushes people to transit. If we've gotten rid of some of these peak, how will that affect transit? Uh, and also if parking is one of the things that's really limited transit and we no longer have as many people work, uh, going into the office, how is that going to affect transit? So these are really interesting questions to be thinking about, which I'm assuming David's going to be talking about somewhat. Um, large drop in TNC ridership, something that we look at a whole lot. You can see steady growth happening over there uh, for a number of years, and then the pandemic happened and it plummeted. Um, they have not recovered a whole lot, not tremendously surprising because of the, uh, the, the uh, need for social distancing. When that goes away, the big question is how we, we're going to be rebounding. I think, I think my sense is that we're going to see a lot of return to these types of um, activities. Large drop in the number of uh, e-scooters and uh, bicycle systems, both docked and undocked. Many of them closed permanently. A lot of them suspended operations uh, or limited operations. We're seeing many of those starting to come back now, especially as we're getting into the spring season over here. Um, online, the, the, uh, the shift to online cannot be overstated. So this is, you know, in 2018, the second quarter, we were about 10% uh, of total retail sales. Uh, in the second quarter of 2020, that went up to above 16%, right? So like a 60% rise uh, happening really quickly. The last two quarters, it's just reduced slightly, but it is hard to imagine that this is going to be going away. Um, the, you know, we've, there's been a lot of shift. We've been in this long enough. The things that we talked about a year ago in this conference, how long are we going to be in this? How many, how many of these things start to become habit? A lot of these habits have cemented themselves. A lot of the business models have been figured out. So this is not going to be going away. Um, what has exploded, uh, however, is the whole uh, meal delivery piece. So um, if you look at DoorDash, Uber Eats, enormous growth, right? More than 100% growth of where we were uh, pre-pandemic, which was already slightly rising. Again, is this, it's hard to believe that this is gonna be going away once these, um, once these uh, uh, trends are, are, are set, once the, the barriers to entry have been overcome. So there might be some reduction as people actually like to go to the restaurants themselves, but my sense is these things are gonna stay uh, high. Uh, tons of restaurants and bar closed uh, throughout the, the country. This is a, a, a survey taken in July. My sense is that is, has gotten worse. Uh, restaurant industry obviously is very sensitive to um, uh, having cash flow all the time is low margin businesses. Uh, so my sense is that we, we've, we're going to be seeing even more of this happening. And then, uh, you know, finally, the, the retail vacancy rates have skyrocketed. We we're at 20% uh, in the middle of uh, last year and end of last year. Th that has come uh, down a little bit in some cities and risen in others, but the, you know, almost double of what we were pre-pandemic. So this is, again, it's going to have significant impacts uh, around around the country. So one thing to keep in mind is that 
these impacts are not equitable. And you're going to be hearing a little bit about that today uh, in some of the presentations that are being coming from the cities. But this is very much a case-shaped event. Uh, people's ability to work from home is very different. <clears throat> Where street improvements are happening and really interesting conversations you're going to be hearing uh, from Oakland about that. Uh, tr the impacts on transit do not affect everyone in the population the same. People who are dependent on transit for uh, uh, movement overall is... is um, it's going to make significant uh, differences. Uh, and then where are neighborhood investments happening, right? So if we're spending more time in our neighborhoods, if we are no longer going to the central city, neighborhoods that are already economically disadvantaged are going to be having more and more trouble uh, with this. So what, is this, all these, what do all these changes mean for cities? What are we seeing on, on the ground? Well, one is more of this, and this was, is not new. Uh, we were already uh, seeing this before the pandemic. E-commerce was putting a huge strain on retail in the United States. That has done nothing but uh, grow. We had the largest number of store closings in the history of the United States uh, last year, and that, but that was, you know, the, the the three of the last four years have had the highest number of store closing in the history of the U.S. So we are just seeing an acceleration of this trend that we were already seeing before. This is a problem in terms of you know, blights on the community, uh, taking away tax base, taking away jobs, taking away places where people actually see each other. Uh, so this is a really big question of what the impacts are going to be as we continue to move forward. A real shift needed in how maybe we organize parts of our cities. Um, what we have seen is a proliferation of this. So um, enormous number of, as we've shifted to e-commerce, huge amount of warehousing that has grown uh, all over the country. The, um, and particularly now, not only in these enormous distribution centers that are at the edges of large metropolitan areas, but actually within metropolitan areas. So Amazon opened a thousand warehouses in suburban neighborhoods uh, or has plans to, uh, to be doing that right now. Uh, E-commerce as a percentage of warehouse leasing is at 20.8%. It was 11% uh, in 2019, so almost double. Um, and we've seen a 15% increase in the cost of warehouse parcels. So. This is coming to, so we're getting rid of all, a whole lot of our retail as a land use, and we're developing this new land use, which you know, is not quite as friendly, we'll say, to a, to a, a pedestrian environment, and you know, generates a whole lot of trips as well in these larger trucks. So it's something for us to think about. Uh, some things you'll be hearing about today, which is really exciting, is that one of the positive things that's happened is that we've started to use public spaces as public spaces, these things called roads. Uh, we've actually gotten uh, taken over some of these spaces, you know, created a lot more uh, bike lanes and, and infrastructure, um, places to for us to actually sit in the street, see each other in the street in parking lots. And so this is this is uh, very excited. I'll tell you from conversations we've been having with cities all over the country, and I'm sure you'll see you're all seeing this as well. These are not thought of as temporary changes. The the shift in rethinking how we deal with public space, the street, uh, to make sure that it accommodates more of us and more uses is something that everyone's very excited about. And then we've seen this shift from urban cores to neighborhood centers. Uh, CBDs are across the country are, have a whole lot less activity than we were seeing before, obviously because of the work from home piece. Uh, it is a mix of who's gonna be staying working from home and who's gonna be coming back to the office. It seems pretty, uh, um, uh, pretty realistic that a whole lot of companies are gonna be go coming back to the office part of the time. So maybe you'll be coming to the office two or three days a week instead of five days a week. So that means a big shift from the amount of activity that we see downtowns, the need for downtowns to a little bit reinvent themselves, um, and a big push to these neighborhood centers, which has already been a trend for the last couple of decades of people moving into these um, or spending more time and wanting to more interest in these neighborhood centers. So being next to near a walkable kind of vibrant neighborhood center is going to be more and more in demand. As I mentioned before, big questions with transit, uh, with reduced peak travel. Uh, this is from New York's uh, MTA. Uh, the orange line is uh, the typical curve of number of riders that we have. The blue line is the COVID curve. So a huge drop in, in peak ridership. We're seeing the same thing in, the, in, in automobile travel. And the whole question I mentioned before is parking demand is completely dropped. How's that gonna impact transit? Uh, David, I'm sure gonna be talking more about that. So a large question we have is how do you plan in an uncertain future? How do you, if, if we're, if it's been very evident now that, um, that what, what's in front of us is very much unknown and you know, projecting out a year or two years is very difficult. Um, how is it that we react to this? And I'll say, and so something we've said a whole lot is doing the same thing when everything change, is changing is a problem. It is 
staying with the status quo when everything is changing is a risk in and of itself. And one of the things that we've been uh, uh, working on and thinking a lot about here at Urban Next has been a real need to change the planning process. So we think of a typical planning process has been something, you know, you plan something, uh, go through a public process, figure out what you're going to do, and then you have, you know, three to five year implementation uh, uh, set, uh, phase of that project, right, to make that happen. That makes very little sense because that trajectory, that whole gray line there, if so many things are changing, it might not make sense what you started doing. So when you're planning an uncertainty, you really have to change the way that you, that you plan. So first of all, you really have to focus on desired outcomes. Where is it we want to get to? What's the, what's the final state that we're trying to get to? And from then, really start thinking about instead of this you know, plan and then implement this thing, is that we think of implementation maybe as a series of pilots. So you pilot something, you try it out, you evaluate it, and then you pivot. And you repeat that cycle. Try another pilot, evaluate that, pivot, and repeat it all the way through. So this is a really different way of working. Some of the issues with it is one, this requires continuous community involvement. You need to be talking to people all the time uh, to make, not just in the planning phase, but also as the pilot's happening, as you're doing the evaluation and uh, communicating why it is that you're shifting, why the pivot is happening, what you're heading to next. This kind of approach as well, every once in a while we're gonna be doing is hopefully getting out of this kind of pivot evaluate, uh, sorry, pilot evaluate pivot cycle and starting to kick off, we'll say some more permanent changes. So new policy and regulations, modification of existing policies, scaling up these pilots. So the pilots are meant to test things and then figure out if we can make them larger. Developing capabilities within agencies or within the private sector, things that need to be um, uh, uh, knowledge you need to have to be able to work better. Um, modify your process, create new initiatives altogether. And then every once in a while, actually, you might have to modify existing goals. So going way back to that first plan and thinking on those desired outcomes, how it is that you change that. Now, there's a few things you need to uh, think about in the, this new planning process that to make it all work. Um, we need to work a little bit differently uh, in cities, right? So we need to manage expectations that so that it includes change, so that people understand as we go through a planning process, uh, as we just say that we're doing something, we're testing it. And you're going to hear a lot about that from the cities that we're that you're going to be here that are, are presenting today, and actually throughout the conference. Uh, there's going to need to be a lot of transparency in terms of timelines and evaluation criteria so people can understand why you're making the changes that you're making and why you're, uh, why you're um, uh, deciding to pivot. If you do, you obviously need uh, um, a lot of data to be able to make that evaluation happen. There has to be a lot more trust between stakeholders. Uh, that you, that more difficult to uh, maintain these kind of arm's length uh, relationships. Uh, you need to really try to have everyone involved so that you can... Um, uh, people can understand what it is that you're doing, understand that you're testing things and understand when you make changes. There has to be an appropriate appetite for risk, which I think is really important. And that is uh, from the kind of staff people within cities that are, that are doing this, but also the leadership within cities, a, a, a willingness to say uh, things might go wrong and that's okay. This is the way that we learn. Obviously, we'd rather not have things go wrong, but in a quickly cha changing environment, it's almost the approach that we have to take. It's the only way that we can learn and keep going. Uh, being much more entrepreneurial on the staff side, you're going to hear a lot about that again today from the cities that we're talking uh, with, and uh, connecting those short-term measures to those long-term ambitions. We call that like the long game, making sure people understand how it is that the things that you're doing right now are really part of a longer vision and how it's th this incremental step is helping get you there. A lot of this work is on Urbanism Next uh, and .org. We invite you all to uh, visit, look around at some of the reports that we've put together. Um, and with that, I will pass it back to Jean, I believe. Or I'll take any questions, I guess. I'm not sure we're doing, I don't remember if we're doing questions or not, Jean. Yeah, thanks, Nico. That was fantastic. We are gonna let uh, David Bragdon, the Executive Director of Transit Center, go ahead and share his presentation. And then we'll have Q&A for both uh, David and Nico's um, great insight. David, are you able to share your screen? Let's Let's see about that. Test it out. All right. And do you see some, do you see more purple than you bargained for? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's exactly how I describe that. Okay, great. Well, uh, let me, let me get this started here. Um, so greeting, greetings from lower Manhattan, uh, where I am sitting in an office built for 16 people and I'm here by myself. Um, 
and I arrived here on a subway this morning that is probably at about 35% of the load that it would have had a year ago. Actually, you know what? Uh, a year and a week ago, I would say a year and two weeks ago, actually a year ago this week, um, I was in bed because I woke up with a kind of a cough and had COVID for a week. So that was what I was up to a year ago. Um, but today uh, it's a different scene here in lower Manhattan and there are predictions for the future that anybody can make. But just for some historical context on September the 12th, uh, 2001, uh, there were certainly predictions that this neighborhood wouldn't come back after the events of the day before September 11th. The World Trade Center is uh, about a five minute walk from where I am right now. And in fact, uh, the, the, the past nearly 20 years, this neighborhood has boomed. Uh, and if you go back to the 1970s, there were predictions that not only this neighborhood of Manhattan, but the whole city was, was also doomed. Well, that turned out to not be true either. So. Let's not make predictions about doom and gloom based on uh, current events. Cities are really, really important. So my topic today is about how transit agencies are and how they should be responding to the current emergency. But I really wanna talk about that in the context of lessons learned in the emergency that can be applied going forward and new practices, new ways of decision-making, new ways of involvement, new ways of prioritizing riders that have been learned on the fly that really should become standard practice going forward. And this is a big deal for an industry that is, as you know, very slow moving, bureaucratic, command and control. Most transit agencies in this country are running a route structure similar to what they were running 50 years ago. They use labor management practices that have been in collective bargaining agreements that have been, been there in decades. It's not an industry that changes very fast. That's where we come in as Transit Center. Uh, we are a civic organization. We're a non-governmental organization. We're a foundation, uh, tax-exempt foundation. We're dedicated to making cities more just and sustainable through better public transportation. We do applied research. We do public advocacy. We do grant making primarily to support community-based advocacy for public transit on behalf of riders' interests. We're active in uh, 20 to 30 of the largest cities in the country in terms of where our grants go and where our regional partners are. Uh, and, and that will inform this pr uh, presentation. Unlike my city colleagues you're gonna hear from later who have specific projects in their towns, uh, I'm gonna touch on some uh, case studies very briefly from a number of places, a number of different transit agencies. Our work is uh, very informed by what it is that's important to riders. So we regularly do surveys of what it is that riders want. Uh, we've, they have a series called Who's On Board uh, going back to 2014, 2016, 2019, really showing what it is that riders want from public transit, which is the fundamentals, frankly. It's not bells and whistles. It's things like reliability, it's speed, it's frequency and it's service uh, throughout the day, all hours of the day. So these are things that we've known for some time, but I think are now, as I'll describe, become more urgent as a result of the pandemic. So we, as, as we pivoted sort of our survey and our, our, our research uh, we, during over, over the past year, uh, collected some of the international information about COVID and transit. And what we found, uh, not surprisingly, as in so many different ways we have learned uh, in, the, in, this, in this country, at least prior to January 20th of this year, uh, other countries were doing a whole lot of things a lot better uh, than we were. Hong Kong, Taipei, uh, studies out of France showed that public transit is not necessarily a super spreader uh, if people will abide by common practices in terms of preventing spread. That uh, characteristically, the that, that characteristics of transit vehicles are different, for example, from other confined spaces. Uh, the, uh, uh, in terms of, for example, contrast with a restaurant, the air circulation on transit, uh, people are not on transit necessarily for very long. Uh, and so, for example, if I were given a choice of we're gonna ride a bus for 20 minutes and everybody's wearing a mask and the doors and windows are ventilated and the 
door opens, you know, every every few blocks, and there's there's circulation, and people are not talking to each other. Uh, that is certainly a safer environment than a restaurant, which has less circulation, and people are exchanging uh, conversation. Uh, we also found, though, this is a strong societal context. These transit exists in a larger society, uh, and this again, where the United States failure uh, was really sector, you know, cross sectoral in, in multiple ways and, and societal and political and and transit exists in that context. Uh, so if if we have a society where there is widespread disregard of, or skepticism about safeguards, if we're in a country where the leadership is giving mixed messages, uh, it makes it that uh, tra transit can't, uh, transit suffers from that uh, as well. So uh, the, the, the transit agency protocols really do have to exist, they inevitably exist in that sort of societal context. But we also found, and this is studied in, cited in, in the New York Times, uh, our work and others, is that public attitudes really are important. Uh, the, the practices of the agency in terms of hygiene are important, but it's the individual behavior is very important. And so acquainting people with those realities and helping them to modify their behavior in the greater good is very important. So our survey this year, rather than doing one of our standard surveys, obviously we, 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 we used uh, the pandemic as a reason to go deep. Uh, and this is a study that is on our website. The things I'll refer to are at transitcenter.org. ORG, and with YouGov, we put together a, 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 a survey of transit riders and non-transit riders in major cities across the country this summer, and finding what are the issues that provoke anxiety, what are the things that address anxiety. And mask wearing is a very strong, came, came out very strong that at, the more people know about the effectiveness of mass and the more compliance that there is, it becomes a self-reinforcing cycle. And that ridership starts to come back, it correlates to that. The subway that I was on this morning, as every subway I've been on in, in New York for the last you know, six, eight months, mass compliance is very, very high. And in fact, New York's reputation for being a contentious place, I think is really actually quite wrong. Uh, New York, whether it's post 9-11 or currently, uh, New Yorkers actually do look out for each other. New Yorkers are used to living in a collective sort of society and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and living accordingly. So the, the compliance very high here. And so uh, again, as in France or in, in Taiwan, uh, makes a big difference. Uh, the survey also reinforced things we've learned in the past uh, about the importance of just basic fundamentals of transit service, it's not bells and whistles, it's not the color of the vehicle, it's not necessarily anything fancy, it's basic things like reliability and the hours of service. This was even more pronounced this year because the preponderance of riders now are shift workers on particular schedules, not the nine to five crowd, and so these issues of frequency and what the tra traditional transit agency thinks of as off peak service becomes all the more important. And that is one of these items that we think needs to become part and parcel of a new way of thinking about transit. Our report this summer, this fall, actually in October, really laid out important ways in which agencies are responding. One is the allocation of service geographically. Many, several agencies, and Portland has been a leader in this. Portland started this in 1985, actually. Uh, you know, and Houston got around to it 20 years later and got a lot of uh, plaudits for it, is bus network redesign. And unlike Portland, much of the country's age transit agencies are running routes that they've been running, as I said, 50, 60, 70 years. Often they're just where the streetcar lines ran. In Brooklyn right here, most, most of the bus lines actually just mimic where the streetcar lines went uh, early, early in the last century. Under the pandemic where demand patterns have changed and so, much more, so many more of the riders are essential workers and, and traffic and uh, trip demand generation is more centered around uh, hospitals or food distribution, agencies have 
done what in effect would usually take them years in doing a network redesign and pivoted pretty quickly to add service on the routes that are most in demand right now and, and drop them. This took uh, lightning speed. Uh, they also started emphasizing more of the off-peak service. Again, we think that's a good thing that ought to persist. On the workforce front, there's been some interesting changes. Pittsburgh, for example, they recognized the, the transit agency that the dispatching, that drivers coming into a confined space and having face-to-face -face interaction as they have for centuries to get their assignments and get their bus, that that created an unnecessary interface and was a, a risky behavior. The general manager of the transit agency, Catherine Kellerman, went to the union and said, look, normally this would take us three years of negotiating and looking at through a 700 page collective bargaining agreement and we'd have to go through all kinds of formalities. Can we just sit down and figure out a better way to do this shift change process and that makes sense and saves lives? And they were able to do it quickly under the duress. And again, if that creates more collaboration to keep people safe, if that creates new ways of labor and management collaborating, that's, that's, that's a really good thing. And then an, uh, the, the other item that we've noticed, and Nico mentioned this too, the reallocation of street space, because as automobile traffic comes back, it's gonna be worse than ever. And so giving an advantage to transit, really, really important. All of these things should transcend the emergency in our point of view. These are all things that ought to be part and parcel of how we do things going forward. So a few case studies, which are on our, on our website. One is San Francisco Muni, uh, which really did a great job very early in the spring. This is in April figuring out where the essential workers are. Now, normally in a normal, this analysis is also on our site, about 35% of transit riders in this country on a typical pre-pandemic day are in the job categories now deemed essential workers. Well, by April, of course, there are about 100% of the riders. And so the routes had to be reallocated. This also de-emphasizes, which again is a good thing, de-emphasizes what's traditionally thought of as the peak, the nine to five, sort of work and recognizing that people travel to work at various hours of the day. And moreover, that the journey to work, which has been sort of the holy grail and the, the, the standard for planning for many years, everything in transportation being planned for peaks, which has an all wide range of, of, of negative impacts from oversizing our roads just to uh, suit a two hour period of demand or uh, the capital expenses of fleet management on a transit agency, buying a whole lot of buses that again have low utilization. And as we start to realize there are a lot of other trips that take place, trips to the doctor, trips for going to church, trips for recreation, that it's not all about the nine to five work trip. That's actually a good thing, makes more, more of a the MBTA in Boston, another great case study where they're, they're an agency that is very adept with data. They know kind of where people are. And for the first time, they really use that data to adapt their uh, scheduling uh, almost in real time. They normally, the MBTA will update their schedules twice a year. Over this summer, they did it about three or four times in a, in a period of a couple of months being very responsive to demand saying, well, this route has three hospitals along it. We're gonna throw more service at that and we're gonna downplay service elsewhere. So all, all of these things we hope will inform things going forward, the federal, including uh, federal policy. Last week, the president signed the American Rescue Act uh, that added 30, about roughly $30 billion for transit, which added to the CARES Act and other actions in 20, 2020, uh, amounts to a very large amount of relief funding for transit, about $60 billion. That's a, that's, a, that's a huge contribution to get the agencies back in some fiscal condition. But the real prize uh, coming up is the Reauthorization Act, which only happens every five years and is normally, frankly, a continuation of the status quo, primarily a status quo that really benefits automobiles and the Highway Trust Fund. This is an opportunity with the President and Secretary of Transportation who are really interested uh, in, in infrastructure, really interested in climate change, really interested in racial equity and racial justice. This is an opportunity rare opportunity, maybe the biggest opportunity since 1956 to really rethink 
our policies about transportation, the underlying things that, that are so favorable toward automobiles and so negative toward not only transit, but biking, biking and walking, and that, that have so many racist underpinnings as well in terms of who gets served and who gets burdened. So we hope that these, the events of the last year will really help to inform uh, how, how this new reauthorization, which would be good for the next five years, and that the importance of transit operations and the fact that they're instrumental to reducing greenhouse gases and improving the equitability of our cities, those should be the measures of success, not the speed of automobiles, level of service, which today is the holy grail for everybody in terms of our regulatory structure and our, our, our funding structure. And of course, it's not all about money. Uh, that's often what the attention in Washington is about the overall money, but it's really about policy change and the hidden incentives, the subsidies to automobiles, the racist structures underlying these things, those policies that we really wanna change. So then finally, this is just sort of our philosophy really is a focus on the fundamentals. There's, there's often, when people talk about the future of transportation, they talk about jet packs or some magical new technology. Uh, you know, our belief is technology is, is a way of just making the things we have work better, uh, you know, better fare collection, better bus shelters, better information, better dispatching, like, but that it really is those fundamentals that I talked about and the fundamentals of, of basic fixed route transit in a dense urban area, it is the technological solution. It may not be sexy. It may not even seem new to a lot of people, but when you have a vehicle that can carry that many people, a place like Manhattan, a place like Portland, a place like Eugene cannot function with the types of facilities if everybody's in an automobile. And that goes as well for the fads that we see take about micro transit. The, just the physical fact is that a vehicle that's running around and may carry five to six people per hour, that is never gonna beat the efficiency of a vehicle that has the capability of carrying 90 or 100 people an hour and the boardings and the multitude of, of dense destinations and origins. And then finally, the other thing that, that gets uh, talked about and we think with uh, techno optimism that is not well-founded is this idea that autonomous vehicles or that app-enabled ride hailing in fact, the, the, in dense urban areas, it's clear that app-enabled ride hailing actually adds to congestion. There's a lot of deadheading, and it also does not meet community standards because it's pre in terms of the dignity of work and the rights of workers to collectively bargain and earn a living wage. And so any type of service that's founded on the pre premise that the drivers ought to be paid five or six dollars an hour and not have health care benefits. Well, that, that just doesn't meet a sense of decency, let alone the physical aspects of how many people can actually be served. So I appreciate the chance to, to be here. Uh, it has been obviously a challenging year, but a lot of lessons learned. And if we apply those then the future of, uh, of cities and uh, is good. And then the future of transit is as well, because uh, tr good transit really is essential to urbanism. So appreciate the chance to, to share. Thank you so much, David. Uh, really fantastic info from both Nico and David. We're gonna take just a minute to answer questions. I'll start off with one from uh, Don. So please put questions in the chat window if you have them, we'll get to as many as we can. Um, asking about an example of the process that Nico described of uh, plan and pilot and evaluate and pivot. And I'll just note, Nico entered it in the chat box of an example with Portland's e-scooter pilot program. But also I encourage you all to think about that framework that Nico shared when you hear the case study. There's gonna be some fantastic insights around how that process plays out. And we hope you'll ask more questions and dig into those um, when we have Q&A with our case studies. Other questions that came through, um, Nico, I think this one is for you. To what extent are the changes that you described based on COVID in the last year, changes in travel behavior, to what extent are those going to be sustained? That is a fantastic question. And uh, I think we all uh, have some speculation about it. So I'll tell you my speculation about it. We, we really don't know. Um, my sense is that we're going to be going back to uh, the office somewhat, but uh, not 
anywhere near where we were before. Um, you know, again, and, and think about that, that number that I said, 84% of New York City is working from home right now, right? Uh, so let's say most people end up going back, but we still have like 20% of people in cities working from home. That is an enormous increase from where we were before and will have dramatic impacts in the things we were talking about, and David was just talking about, with, which is peak travel. Um, that is going to have, I, I find that very plausible that we're going to be going to, you know, three, three days a week, maybe four days a week, even uh, it's for some people going back to the office, but a whole lot more flexibility and a whole lot more meetings like this. That small shift makes a tremendous shift because as David was saying, everything we've done bizarrely, but everything we've done has been to like, you know, capacity to peak travel. And if we, if that is now flattened out, that completely changes uh, the whole transportation uh, system. So I, I think we're going to be seeing fairly dramatic changes uh, just based on these um, on these small things. But uh, I, I would also ask David what he thought because uh, I think this is this is definitely a, a place of speculation. Yeah, and I think it certainly goes beyond transportation. It goes to real estate and and the development industry generally. Uh, and is anybody's guess? I mean, I, you know, I, I I started by referring to September 11th, 2001, because again, there were predictions this neighborhood was outmoded and would never come back. And the fact is, people, if you're an urbanist, you believe people like cities. They like proximity. Uh, that that being said, I mean, I think we have learned that remote work for some folks is more effective. I think intercity travel, the idea of going across the country to, to have a two-day meeting is, you know, maybe proved to be a little excessive, both in terms of our wear and tear on ourselves, but also the GHG. Um, but I, I, I think it, it's a healthy thing if the transportation planning is less peak oriented and our investment policies are less peak oriented. And I think the other thing to remember, again, in focusing on, for one thing, focusing on office work overlooks <laughs> the essential workers who are having to go to work and the need to serve them even better. And these are generally, there's a correlation between low income and black Americans and people who have been underrepresented in the political process and decision-making process. And so changing those decision-making processes to be more representative is, 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 is an important piece of this. And then outside the world of work, <laughs> there's a lot of trips. It's fact that the majority of trips is people who aren't going, they're going to the dock, they're going to, uh, I mean, here they're going to the Mets game or the Yankees game, or they're going to uh, play, or they're going to see friends or they're visiting relatives. And so that's, uh, again, that's, that's not going away. I think we're going to see in the next six months, there's a lot of pent up demand for, for travel, not, not for getting out and around. And, and I'll just to build on one thing which I didn't mention, but I agree 100%. Cities are not going away. I mean, like the, the, the demise of cities has been that, that you, you could write like a really interesting book on the number of times that we've predicted that cities are going to go away. Uh, we are, on the one hand, social creatures. On the other hand, there's just tons of opportunity when we all get together. Uh, is this type of thing, has this added uh, you know, a chance to do things remotely? Yes, absolutely. But there's a ton of stuff that we still love to do in person with each other. And if, if anything, I think this time has shown us how much we want to be with each other. I've said a number of times, I feel like we're about to hit the roaring 20s. As soon as things open up, I think cities are going to be exploding with people. The, the working in offices might not come back, but I think everything else that we do in cities is absolutely going to be coming back. Everything that we like to do with each other. Warren, did you want to chime in on this? Looks like you raised your hand. Sure. Thanks, Jean. Just to add to your point, Nico, I think, and as we continue this conversation, we should probably disassociate people's love of cities with love of working in an office, right? Like, I think people have sort of said the demise of the city is because of the demise of the office. And those two things don't have to be the same, right? Like, people move to cities not because they love working, right? Like, my... <laughs> my enjoyment from living in Oakland, working in San Francisco, whatever, right? Like is not because I like going into an office every day. It's because I'm closer to friends, I'm closer to resources, I'm closer to good restaurants. And I think as you'll, not to segue into my presentation even, but as you'll see in lots of slow streets programs or shared streets, you name it, that proves that people want to be proximate to one another. They just don't want to be working, which 
feel that. <laughs> like I, re I really do. That's a great point. Let's, we have two more questions before we switch over to the case studies, one for Nico, uh, one more for David. So Nico, there was a question about uh, whether the, there will be a resurgence in retail shops or will those buildings be used for other purposes? And maybe the same question around office buildings. Um, I find it, I mean, so all, if, if we look at the trend, as I was saying before COVID, we were already heading towards, you know, tons of big boxes that were just vacant all over the place. Malls, you know, I don't think a, a mall has been built, a, a, a large indoor mall has been built for ages in, in the country. Um, where, you know, I just read uh, the other day something like a quarter to a third of, of indoor malls are, think, are thought to, uh, are going to be going away in the next uh, few years. The, the, the shift of retail, we are, we're already seeing this, it's just been accelerated. The question is then, what do we do with these spaces? And, you know, to be quite honest, some of these spaces weren't exactly wonderful, right? The, like the big box environments with large parking lots in front of them weren't great spaces. Uh, so I think there's an opportunity for areas to reinvent themselves. The, the, the real interesting piece for all of you planners on here is how quickly can you rezone uh, and can you change what's allowable in these different areas so that you can incorporate um, some of the retail spaces into other types of uses. Warehouse seems to be really interested in a lot of retail spaces right now. I'm not sure if that's exactly the, the, the perfect uses, uh, but uh, it's, uh, one thing to think about. Um, yeah, I, th I think there's going to be the, the those things are not are not uh, going to be coming back. And David, there was a question here as to whether you think we'll see an investment in high speed rail systems or other means of transportation in the near future. Yeah, well, I think that you know the the president and Secretary Buttigieg have both been mentioning that, and so I I, I think there's definitely going to be an initiative around that. And there was in the American Recovery and uh, Act in uh, 2009 that didn't produce a whole lot. It was eight billion dollars, but it actually didn't yield a whole lot of results. And there are lessons to be learned there. I think the first is to talk not about high speed rail and think about Japan or the TGV, uh, the Shinkansen in Japan or the TGV in France, but to be thinking uh, in terms of hot, higher, <laughs> higher speed rail than what we have now. And, you know, as you might've picked up from my presentation, I'm sort of an incrementalist about certain things and that, um, that there's, there are incremental improvements that can be made that are, can be quite significant. And that when you think about Often, often the attention is also paid to top speed rather than average speed when average speed is actually far more important. So uh, take Seattle to Portland, 186 miles, two cities with you know, commonalities, a lot of interaction between Portland and Seattle could be possible in terms of, of, of higher speed rail, 186 miles. So you know, that to, to the, the cost and land acquisition and so on to achieve a 250 mile an hour train is really not worth the time savings. Whereas if you can just average 90, you've got it under two hours and you're beating the automobile, which is the competition and you're making flying irrelevant at that point. So, I, you know, I think the approach needs to be, you know, how, how do you achieve the 125 mile an hour as a, as a max, which you can do with existing technology and, and is much easier than, than going the Japan France route, and then picking the corridors where you have major cities like Seattle and Portland that are, you know, within 250 miles of each other and are significant. Um, and the obstacles to that are this is sort of our federal system, that our federal system deals in terms of states, state governments, rather than city pairs. Most city pairs are not encompassed in a single state. Uh, so in the case of Seattle, Portland, like that ODOT doesn't give a rip about Seattle because only 10 miles of the route is in the state of Oregon. But it's incredibly economic and important to Portland to have that access to Puget Sound and vice versa, yet most of the mileage is in Washington state. So, you know, how do you allocate those costs? You have to get beyond the state government somehow. And, you know, and then the Midwest, you have governor, like the government, you know, the government in Indiana not finding this so important. So you can't really connect Cleveland and Chicago, even though it's incredibly important to those two economies. So again, you've got to get the state governments out of it. So there's a real 
great market case to be made for it, but it's held up by our political system. Thank you, David. Um, we're gonna go ahead and shift on to our next session. We hope the conversation around all of this will continue. Nika, are we able to do the second poll? You're on mute. Let me test it. I don't think I am not able to. Yeah, for some reason it's that that okay. shutdown doesn't exist. I apologize for that. That is okay. We're gonna we're gonna move ahead. This will keep us on track anyway. Um, I would like to um, introduce our four uh, case study panelists. I'm going to go ahead and introduce all four of them, and then we'll just shift into um, each of their presentations. First up, we're going to have Nick Falbo from the City of Portland Bureau of Transportation um, sharing a case study. We'll then be followed by Warren Logan from the City of Oakland, California, then Julian Sabula from Salt Lake City, Utah, and then finally, Scott Curry from City of Charlotte, North Carolina. So excited to have them all here, and they'll each be sharing their own um, slides. So Nick, if you are ready, share your screen and we will jump in. And remember to use the chat window and we'll have um, a good chunk of time for Q&A following the four presentations. Thanks, Jane. I am ready. Let me share my screen. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Nick Balbo. I'm a senior transportation planner at the Portland Bureau of Transportation. And today I'll be sharing about our Bureau's street use response to the COVID crisis that we call the Safe Streets Initiative. You'll hear about how we pivoted in a time of crisis to change the work that we do for our community, how we adopted a nimbler approach in our temporary programming, and how we focus our short-term responses to advance our long-term goals. Uh, life under COVID hit us fast just, you know, this week, a year ago. As neighbors to Seattle, we were watching the first U.S. outbreak uh, happening next door, and we really weren't prepared for the drastic and immediate changes to our lives. Those first few weeks were rough. You had workers still getting used to remote working. You had families that were juggling children out of school, field crews that had to adapt to physical distancing guidelines that we were still learning. And uh, PBOT, as a bureau, our revenue was dropping off of a cliff as people stopped paying for parking downtown. And this larger question haunted us as a bureau, what is the role of a transportation bureau when the prevailing guidance from the state is to stay home? You know, it's not about moving. What do we do? What is, what is our purpose? Uh, there was a lot of skepticism about a street response in our bureau for months. Uh, even our own commissioner and mayor were publicly discounting the idea of a street use response uh, out, just out of an abundance of caution. Um, but we did get to develop a plan and a framework for guiding our work during COVID. Uh, our framework centered on telling a bigger story about this moment, about how what we do now fits into a longer range vision uh, as a city. And so our COVID street response, it wouldn't be just a reactionary one-time event, it would be a necessary and ongoing step toward recovery. And one that would adapt to changing circumstances and prepare us for what's coming next. Um, by putting our temporary work plan in this bigger context of a bigger vision, it helped sell it to supervisors, to leadership, and to skeptical elected officials. And it really provided us a path forward in a time where uncertainty was overwhelming, and it really continues to guide us today. The framework presented four interconnected and overlapping waves of change, starting with staying home and saving lives, moving to supporting physical distancing, and then ultimately kind of where we are now, getting into this conversation about economic recovery and reinvestment and reimagining a better future. Um, I also want to take a minute to raise import the importance of equity, involvement, and supporting our community partners in parallel with this effort PBOT formed a frontline community partnership program just developed by our former equity director, Irene Marion, who's now with USDOT. Uh, the program really helped us partner with community-based organizations throughout the city to strengthen our outreach and our connection with our most vulnerable community members. The early months of the pandemic were spent on staying home and saving lives, and PBOT's work was really centered on helping others. Other bureaus achieve goals to support our community, including hygiene stations, emergency coordination, uh, using our streets for food distribution and uh, sanitizing and discounting transportation systems such as our streetcar and our uh, bike share. But the highest profile moves really came as we moved into supporting physical distancing because this really involved visible changes to our streets. And this, uh, the three main programs of our effort was uh, slow streets, safer busy streets, and healthy businesses. The Slow Streets program established a basic network of highly visible, low-volume local streets prioritized for people walking and biking. 
Uh, in the early days of COVID, the slow speed installations, uh, they got a lot of attention across the country, as well as criticism about the risks of implementing new infrastructure during a pandemic. Now, we approached it really with caution by installing the first phase of our, uh, our work on the existing neighborhood greenway network. These streets have already been designed for better walking and biking, and these interventions strengthen and reinforce their role in the community. A later expansion of the Slow Streets Network let us bring this tool to other parts of town after more feedback and involvement. And many of the second round installations were on streets where previous planning had recommended future neighborhood greenway construction. Uh, overall, the responses have been overwhelmingly positive. Um, as we went through a kind of a cycle of implementing and learning, you know, we have our eyes on the future and we're looking at uh, developing a new kind of permanent slow street tool to help us uh, implement future neighborhood greenways uh, and planning practices. The Safer Busy Streets program used temporary materials to provide more room to walk on streets with narrow or missing sidewalks. And these projects included corridor installations along multiple blocks, as well as uh, curb bulb out installations. And all of these locations are on our Vision Zero high crash network. Uh, this process involved continuous feedback with the community where these were deployed. The feedback wasn't always positive. We actually heard a lot of understanding about the need for some of these changes, poor installation legibility and impacts to on-street parking, and just a general lack of community support in some cases. So in response, we modified the projects for better clarity. We even removed some segments that were considered unsuccessful. And I think willingness to admit that some things just aren't working, whether that's the design or the location, that's an important part of a pilot process. And in the long run, this really did introduce a new tool. Peabot had never really done these painted curb extensions before. And we're now talking about how to integrate these tools into our capital project pipeline. The Healthy Businesses Permitting Program is what allowed businesses to use street space to meet physical distancing guidelines. The application was no cost, it was quick, and it was really meant to reduce barriers to access. Uh, a lot of our effort was spent reaching out to community organizations to help them participate. And uh, persistent barriers to small businesses included a lack of resources for design and implementation, and so we formed partnerships with Portland State University to provide design services, offer traffic control to BIPOC owned businesses for free. And we're now investing in a street plaza toolkit with things like tents and benches to give to people who need them. Um, and so, but even then we really weren't getting all of the participation that we hoped to in some of our black centered business districts. So we worked with NACTO to get some funding to take these ideas even further and facilitated a black centered plaza space with our community partners. And it's been very successful with hundreds of permits issued. In the long run, we wanna take these lessons learned about reducing barriers to entry uh, to support ongoing equitable community street plaza development. Uh, one overall challenge we had for planning during COVID is how to safely involve the general public in our work. But while meetings can move online, in-person engagement has been off limits. So to solve this, we've been using a new text-based survey approach, posting signs and stickers in the street, to receive hyper-local awareness and feedback on the work we were doing. And this feedback is informing kind of expansions uh, into here into 2021. As an overall reflection, there are really a few things that helped us succeed and overcome internal and external opposition. The work we were doing was low impact. Uh, it had a real sense of purpose and utility. We were using temporary materials, uh, which allowed for easy modification or removal. Uh, it was built on past plans and programs so that we weren't really inventing anything new and in many cases acted as kind of pre-implementation of funded projects. And by maintaining a responsive feedback loop for community involvement and a decentralized structure for implementation, we were able to respond quickly. And then finally, our work really maintained a focus on the future while meeting the needs of today so that the work we were doing seems relevant now and seems relevant in the future. Uh, thanks for that. I look forward to the conversation later. Great, thank you, Nick. Warren, if you're ready, get to you. Yeah, um, I am super ready. Hold on, let me share my screen. Um, and then if I click Great. incorrectly. Okay, hey everybody. Um, I am Warren Logan and I'm really excited to um, share with you virtually the same presentation, but in Oakland, and that's the exciting part, right? Um, I will try and fly through some of the more common slides that I think Nico just shared as well, and then um, and then talk with you about some of the lessons learned that, that we had for open slow streets and, and during COVID. So first I'll describe our slow streets program, which is our neighborhood traffic calming. 
Then I'll describe a little bit about the uh, feedback that we received, especially in our um, communities of concern, primarily in deep East Oakland, and then uh, discuss some of the pivots that we made, which are called essential places, uh, our flex streets program, and then finally how all of these kind of fit together and, and help us sort of solidify what the next phases should look like even beyond COVID. Uh, and actually, a week from now, last year, so um, this time last year in April, excuse me, the mayor announced that we would be closing 74 miles of Oakland streets to uh, through traffic to allow for people just like this to walk around and just sort of stretch their legs. Um, one of the major reasons we did this is not only to calm traffic when it was getting even more dangerous, but also to discourage people from all gathering at Lake Merritt, which is this beautiful kind of 5k mile um, lake in the middle of the city. Uh, for many folks who, who saw slow streets, this is exactly what it looked like. Families just walking around and enjoying what at the time was California sunshine. We recognized though that in DP Stokeland, a number of community groups shared with us and quite viscerally at times that this is not what their experience was. And, and even if traffic was reduced, they felt that they didn't have ownership of the program and that it, that it might seem like gentrification or that the city was trying to displace them from their um, community, which is obviously a misfire. And so after working with those community-based organizations, they shared with us, you know, if you're going to help, right, help us get to the grocery store, help us literally just cross the street. And so we launched what's called the Slow Streets Essential Places Program. What this does, is it uses the same sort of tactical urbanist uh, moves. You know, you've got the cones, you've got the signs here. And we worked with those CBOs to identify, you know, five at a time or so where neighborhood clinics were, um, where pop-up testing sites were operating, uh, food, and then even, you know, just getting people to the dry cleaners at times, right? And we just set these up and, and it's, they've now transitioned into, um, not just these dinky cones, but into the soft hit posts. And now we have um, the hard hit posts, which is pretty exciting as well. So a month later, as we were opening the economy back up and then closing it later, uh, we started this program called the Flex Streets Program. And what's exciting about it is that, you know, this, the city of Oakland, like many others, had major and minor encroachment permits already, which probably many of you are familiar with as the tool to enabling you know, cafe seating, uh, sidewalk eateries, you know, you've got the parklets and even full street closures. Recognizing though that many of the businesses we were trying to engage during this process were not used to talking with the government or, or applying for a multi-month, you know, two, three thousand dollar permit. Uh, we basically wiped the slate clean and, and built a new permitting program that allowed for automatic per permits you could draw out on a napkin literally um, what you were planning to do and we provided templates to people who needed extra help. And we went from having, I think, four official parklets to over 50. And we had, I think, about 300 applications for flex streets, which is pretty exciting. Additional to this though, is that we basically brought all of our mobile food vending programs into compliance. We actually didn't have a food truck program before Flex Streets and were able to basically provide a permit system for this whole industry that had just been sort of in the shadows in Oakland. What's unfortunate again though, when you're starting to see a theme here is that while we had you know, nearly 300 applications, only three of those, right? So less than 1% really were in deep East Oakland. And again, we're starting to question, you know, why is it that the same neighborhoods are not able to participate in these programs even as we are lowering barriers, right? Even as we're making them freeze, even as we're providing technical support. Uh, I just wanna sort of draw a lasso around all of the different street-based programs that we offered, just to share with you that, you know, not only did we have slow streets, but essential places and flex streets, that's in combination with our murals program and we provided testing and now vaccination services right in the streets, on city property, on city parking lots, all for free. And when you look at this sort of in a comprehensive way, you start to realize that each of these different programs is, is sort of providing dividends and, and lessons learned to each other. And as we move forward, you know, reopening the economy for the second or third time now, 
we're planning on creating sort of this menu of options for folks so that it's not just a one size fit all, but rather a, we, you know, the community says, I feel like my streets aren't safe enough. I would like to pick from a menu of, of options and programs to make our community safer. Our Flex Streets program is going to be, hopefully, formally adopted by our council uh, to allow for this sort of um, burgeoning industry of, of parklets and, and street closures and, and special events. And then we're going to take our cultural markets and marry that with Flex Streets to hopefully engage our, um, you know, sort of POC BIPOC community to participate more in these sort of pop-up merchant activities. What's also sort of salient, and this is the, I think the takeaway that I wanna share with all of you is that we're not only allowing our pro, you know, encouraging our programs and our teams to learn from each other, we are also transitioning from city run programs into CBO partnerships and providing technical support along the way. So that at the end of the day, we are creating a, a more resilient community base that is able to not only navigate ideally less restrictive government policies, but that they understand how to help themselves, sort of the train the trainer model. The other lessons learned are here, right? So we've got partnering with the community. That's you know, what has really made a number of these programs successful. Again, training community leaders. We found from Flex Streets that templating best practices helped us you know, create a plan for one group and then share that with others. I, I actually received a number of emails even recently from newer businesses that said, hey, I want that parklet that that other group has. Can I have that? And we're like, yes, here was their approved plan. Send this back to me and that is your complete application, right? Um, again, working across silos, uh, the team that brought this together was actually through our emergency operations group that I, I helped lead in our community resilience team. And that includes Department of Transportation, Economic and Workforce Development, Police, Fire, City Administrators, and the Planning Department. And having that, that senior leadership from each one of those departments helped us make decisions so much faster. If someone said, I have an idea, the other group could say, I will sign off on that. And in one meeting, we had written half the policy, right? Um, the final piece, and I think this is perhaps the most important point that we're still learning in spades, especially from pushback in, in DP Stokeland, is that if the community doesn't feel like they own the program, that, that it is their program, it's always going to receive this pushback. And so we're, we're learning both through the partnerships and through um, sort of this shared iterative experience, how to engender that community ownership. And I, I, um, I share that lesson learned with all of you to sort of encourage in each of your cities to use that as a focal point for um, how to move forward. Back to you, Jean. Well, fantastic, um, great stuff, thank you. We are gonna move on to Salt Lake City and hear from Julianne. And thank you all for submitting questions. Keep those coming. We're looking forward to some discussion. Are you able to share your screen? Yes, sorry, I, my mouse was having a hard time fantastic. finding the right monitor. Uh, thank you, Jean. Okay. Um, yeah. Here it comes, I hope. Um, here we go. Okay, are you seeing my screen? We can see it. Great. I can't seem to move. There we go. Sorry, guys. Um, okay, let's get to the first slide. Uh, my name is Julianne Sabula, and I manage strategic planning for the Salt Lake City Transportation Division. Um, we work on master plans. We work on policy. Um, it's a really fun group um, to work with. Um, my presentation is is less about on the ground stuff and more about some conceptual work uh, that we were doing prior to the pandemic and some other things happening. Um, it, this is in the west side of our city. Um, it's mainly industrial, but it's kind of a weird mishmash of uses. So you have the Salt Lake City International Airport, you've got some uh, migratory bird refuge and some pretty sensitive lands, marshlands. 
Um, and then you have these, the, this sort of industrial major job center. Um, the, the study area job numbers are the same as in our central business district. Um, it's just that the density is really, really low. It's across 28,000 acres compared with 160 acres in our downtown. Um, these businesses were really struggling pre-pandemic, um, primarily due to transportation issues. Um, there are very few streets. There are The transit options are really circuitous, um, time consuming, lots of transfers, and they're not really at the right time of day for a lot of these jobs. It's a lot of shift work. Um, and so, you know, many businesses, UPS was an example, they said we have a 30% employee turnover rate just due to transportation. Um, in addition, you know, city staff has been getting complaints about parking, about traffic congestion, uh, especially during peak periods, because you have, you know, not only commutes, but you have a lot of freight movement through the area. And this, this whole area is crisscrossed by heavy rail lines. Um, it, you know, in addition to a limited number of, of state-owned roads. Um, and then the area is, an, is newly an inland port. Um, and I, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but it's increasing the number of jobs out there. There are buildings going up, um, you know, by the day, it seems like. Um, and so we're getting even more freight movement in the area. Um, and then finally, it's an area that's pretty highly contested uh, it, in part because the state took over the area. And so there's mixed feelings um, on the part of city residents um, and in part from environmentalists who are concerned you know, about air quality and about um, the land out in that part of the city. Um, so what we came in to do, it was an offshoot of our transit master plan. Um, and, and this was to take low density job centers and help establish some transportation management associations. And so, you know, we got together with some, some champions, you know, we had Sephora, a manager there, you know, a couple of businesses that were really excited about finding solutions, um, bringing businesses together uh, to solve some of the problems they were having with transportation. Um, we were looking to start with early win transportation demand management strategies. You know, can we start running shuttles from major transit stops to these businesses um, and so forth and then, um, we wanted to, to implement some pop-up projects just to create, you know, some visibility. The businesses are so spread out, you don't have the same kind of cohesion as in, say, an office park um, where people are closer together and they're kind of joined by CCNRs and so forth. So um, then we had a series of disruptions. Um, um, among them, not only the pandemic, but we had a uh, major earthquake in March. In fact, right after we went to work from home, tomorrow it will be, it will have been a year ago that we had this earthquake. Um, and so that created a lot of havoc around the city and then weeks of aftershocks. Um, and then in September, we had a major windstorm and that windstorm tore out 2000 trees across the city. Um, and, and that pulled down a bunch of infrastructure, you know, overhead wires, it pulled down, um, pulled up sidewalks. Um, and so it was just, a mess all over the city um, and just kind of recovering from one state of emergency and moving to the next. Um, in addition to that, you know, because of the pandemic, a lot of these businesses, so Amazon, Netflix, um, you know, UPS, Sephora, these are businesses that are busier than ever during the pandemic because so many people, you know, kind of like we heard from earlier speakers are, are shopping now through the mail instead of in brick and mortar places. Um, and so they were just having a hard time getting enough workers. Um, they weren't, <laughs> their, tra their transportation concerns were there, um, but they just didn't have the time or energy, you know, to invest in finding solutions to that. Um, and in addition to that, you know, just in terms of our outreach efforts with workers and residents, they're worried about getting food on the table, um, not talking to us about their transportation needs. And finally, you know, we've had many, 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 many months now of protests um, and the responsiveness I think has been kind of mixed uh, in terms of our elected officials. Um, and so trust in government is, is really low, um, especially in this part of the city. So we did a total turnaround. Um, we decided to shift away from the 
industrial area and we moved into a new focus area that's kind of sandwiched between that industrial area and the rest of the city. Um, and so you can kind of see on this map, it's really um, boxed in, it's fully residential. There are a few neighborhood retail centers, but by and large, it's single family residential. Um, and it's kind of locked in by freeways um, as well as rail lines. Um, the history of redlining in the city has led to a you know, pretty long history of marginalization of the folks that live in this area. Um, it's definitely the, high, the areas of highest diversity um, are in this study area. Um, as well as high transit propensity. So, you know, households with people with disabilities, um, people too old to drive, too young to drive, people without cars, and people who have low incomes. And these are the people that we've had the hardest time reaching in terms of our outreach. It's always really skewed toward the east of the city. Um, and, you know, a lot of it, I think, is just these people um, have young families and they're really busy. They often are working two jobs. Um, and so coming to a public meeting is not something that really makes sense as a priority. So the tasks we decided to engage were to do more detailed research and data collection in this area, and then just brainstorm a whole menu of solutions and make ourselves available to people to understand how those solutions resonate. Um, and finally, to do something tangible. You know, the, this area has been studied a lot and I don't think they want to hear about another study happening in the area without action to follow pretty immediately. So then we had our first meeting, a bunch of community organizations came together um, to talk with us and it was a little bit disheartening. Um, we thought, oh, they're going to be so glad we got them all together and we're going to work together and we're going to do something. Um, and these are some of the quotes that we heard. Um, I think notably we can see in terms of how um, consultants and traditional government folks translate things. Um, this one quote, when I mean, you talk about the importance, or sorry, there is a lack of trust, and it was transcribed by the consultant as there are communication challenges. Um, those are really different things, and so we had to kind of go back and examine how we're approaching these things. Um, a lack of trust is just not the same as a communication challenge, um, and it, you can't address it in the same way. Um, we came up with several initiatives that um, failed. <laughs> and so um, a lot of what we're talking about today is about that, you know, sort of um, you try, you pilot something and then when it doesn't work, you try something new and replan and go back through that cycle that Nico was talking about. Um, and so one of the things the community was telling us is, you know, we don't want more bike racks at our bus stops. We want to be able to charge our phones and have Wi-Fi. Um, you know, right away we ran into an obstacle, um, kind of David was talking about sort of the slow and cautious nature of transit agencies and of course maintenance concerns are always at the top of the list where that's concerned. So, you know, that was an effort that we just couldn't give people what they wanted, at least not yet. Um, we're still working on it. Um, we did, we have had some luck with tapping into, we have a West Side Leadership Institute and um, they have a program that essentially trains people for community engagement in their own neighborhood. Um, and so we've, we've gotten some traction with compensating those, those graduates of the program for their time, um, a little bit looping them into consultant contracts. We haven't found a great way to do, do that directly, to hire them directly, um, but we're working on that as well. Um, we also kind of heard, you know, from among those those quotes, hey, we've given you lots of input. W what are you doing with it? Don't come ask us more questions. Do something from what you learned in prior studies. And so we went through and just combed through every survey that the city had done, not just from transportation, but kind of across the city um, and other organizations like the health department. Um, and really what came out of this is that we can't reach out to this community and just say, what do you want for transportation? Or do you want this kind of bike lane or that kind of bike lane? Um, that we need relationships before we can even get to that stage. And you know, I, I attended a pre presentation a couple of years ago and one of my favorite quotes from that presentation was just, you know, you can't, you can't propose on your first date. Um, and often that's what we're doing as government people um, is saying, here, we have what you need and tell us which one you want, and we're gonna go do it. Um, and what's your name, by the way? And so we're kind of working toward being in the community more um, and having a really open approach in our engagement. So instead of thinking about our own objectives, 
start to get a sense of what people's objectives are more globally and kind of in that same spirit of breaking down silos that Warren was talking about, you know, come back um, and say as a city, how do we more holistically respond to what we're hearing from this community? Um, art and storytelling have been a big part of this community and other non-transportation related efforts. Um, and we think we may be able to seek input through that. Um, lots of young families, as I mentioned over here, this is the youngest part of our city. And so, you know, not only children, but um, young college students. And so we have a real opportunity to seek input um, through them. We have a lot of programs um, out in the area where we can have touch points with people and, um, you know, through a lot of these kids, especially because so many people don't speak English, um, you know, through kids, we can get some translation from older people within their households. So um, that's what we're working on now. <laughs> um, I guess, you know, in conclusion, the early wins that we were seeking at the very beginning of this process, um, they're really found within the status quo. What will work right away and make everybody happy with what we're doing so that we can continue? Um, we have to accept some failure uh, at this point and it, it, trying new things just entails that. Um, and so I think it's really about developing a comfort level with trying and failing and trying and hopefully sometimes succeeding and refining and going back again. Um, you know, that's really been the theme of this year for us. And we hope our elected officials will stand behind us, uh, even though we don't have great results to show them yet. Uh, so with that, thank you. I'll pass it back to Jean. Thank you, Julianne. That's another um, great story of lessons learned and plans for moving forward. Scott, if you, Scott Curry from City of Charlotte, if you are ready, this will be our fourth case study presentation, and then we're going to shift over to Q&A, and then we'll have um, some time for breakout groups to discuss some of what we're learning um, with each other. Scott, I will pass it over to you. Great. Thanks. Happy to um, be with y'all. Hopefully you are, are seeing my screen and not my notes. Um, really happy to be a part of the session. I um, am with the city of Charlotte. I'm a, an urban designer and transportation planner. Um, for our Department of Transportation and oversee our active transportation program. Um, currently, I'm also leading the Charlotte Moves Strategic Mobility Plan. So we are in the midst um, during COVID and the other disruptions of the past year of, of rewriting our transportation plan. Um, just a quick sort of primer on, on who we are as a city. Um, we have a population of um, almost a million folks. Metro is about 2.6 million. We're the largest city in the Carolinas, the 15th largest in the USA. We are one of the fastest growing large cities in the country right now. Our, our countywide growth rate um, is about 60 people per day. Um, we're a big financial energy and banking center. Um, and like a lot of our large cities across the country, um, in the past decade, we've become a majority minority community. Um, and one of the things that has made our experience over the last year um, really interesting and challenging um, is the fact that we are in the middle of a lot of ongoing planning efforts. It's not just this citywide transportation plan. Um, we're also taking on our first comprehensive plan update, the first major update since 1975, when our population was about 300,000 folks. Um, we are rewriting our park and rec master plan, some major transit system planning in initiatives. Um, we're also rewriting our entire development regulation framework in a new UDO. So the question that collectively we've had to face as a city over the last 12 months is, what do you do when you're in the middle of rethinking everything and then everything changes around you? Um, and my role in that has been um, on the, the strategic mobility plan side, but really the entire city has kind of been wrestling with this. How, how do we sort of step back, take stock and, and figure out how to move forward um, with all of these concurrent planning efforts? Um, so just to put some of this in context, the, really the big three efforts on the city side are the, the 2040 comp plan, which, which sets the vision for our growth, uh, the unified development ordinance, which will become the rules that help to implement that vision, and then my piece of the puzzle, the strategic mobility plan, which is really gonna be our strategy for how we connect it and, and how we um, coordinate our capital investment in transportation over the next 30 years. 
So in terms of what we set out to do with our strategic mobility plan, first and foremost was to implement the, the comp plan. That's really our North Star. It also helps to draw a clear line between what we're doing and those concurrent planning efforts. Um, we know we're gonna spend some time updating and combining past transportation plans, um, setting new goals, including potentially a, a mode shift goal for um, getting folks out of cars and, and trying to expand other transportation networks. And then this fifth thing is, is something that we had written kind of into the scope of the project before COVID um, and before the, um, the racial justice movement over the last 12 months, we, we knew that we needed to respond to a changing world. Um, we were thinking more about things like e-scooters and autonomous vehicles. And then the world sort of changed around us. And, and we said, oh my gosh, we have to figure out what does post-pandemic mobility look like? How do we... Um, get uh, more thoughtful about supporting transportation equity. And so that's the part of our, our project that, that really changed. Um, and we've tried to figure out how best to respond to those two things. I'm, I'm gonna say up front, we've got a lot of humility about this and I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to the breakout groups to get some feedback from uh, colleagues on the call. I, I, I think some of the other speakers um, had said similar things. So um, a couple of things that, that changed for us, um, Nico and David did a great job about kind of giving you a primer on future travel patterns. What, what has changed, what sorts of changes might be sticky and what others might fade away. Um, we have had an even greater focus and urgency towards engaging people who typically are left out of planning processes. And I'll talk a little bit about how we have tried to do that. Um, we've engaged specifically with questions around um, post-pandemic preferences. So we know no one's commuting right now like they used to. We're trying to understand how people expect to go back to normal life once we really emerge into a post-pandemic situation. Um, and then also sort of a deeper engagement around these issues of transportation equity. Um, a couple of things that, that haven't changed. Um, we haven't changed our, our emphasis on safety, accessibility, and multimodal choices. Um, we had set out with a phased approach to our plan development, and that, that now seems like a really, really good move because we've had to stop a couple of times um, just to take stock of where we're at and make sure that we feel like we're still heading in a responsive direction. And then um, something else that has been really important to us as a city is um, focusing on um, the spatial patterns of inequity that exist within Charlotte. Um, the three maps at the right are comparisons of different characteristics of our city, um, voter participation at the top, race at the bottom right, median household income, bottom left. You can see there's this sort of arc and wedge pattern. Um, the wedge is where a lot of the affluence in our city is down to the south. Um, the arc are, are other neighborhoods where this um, history of, of inequity and marginalization um, is really still evident. And so that's been a big focus of our planning effort. So our early engagement plan had, had these five pillars. Everything that you see in red are, are things that we pivoted on um, over the last 12 months. So we've, you'll see as you kind of look through this, we've um, deepened our engagement around um, equity questions. We've added these equity focus groups um, as a way to try to really engage with uh, those folks who don't typically have an opportunity to participate in planning processes. And um, we have um, set a precedent now of doing paid participation for those focus groups. We, we are trying to model equity in our own planning process, not just in the, the recommendations of our plan. And that's one way that we felt like we could do that. Um, we've changed the types of questions we're asking in our public surveys. Um, and so really it's, it's kind of been a hodgepodge of sticking with the things that, that we thought were still on target um, and pivoting and responding to things that have come our way in the last year. And so I'm, I'm gonna share some of our early results. We're still midstream on, on this um, transportation planning process, but some early um, and interesting results for us um, include some of the things we're hearing about transportation equity. We, we've tried to be really thoughtful about how we define this in a specific way. And so we've had really strong support for these two ideas of um, defining equity as focusing investment on the people and places um, that are most vulnerable and also focusing investment on the modes of transportation that have been historically under invested like walking, biking and transit.
And then when it comes to um, behaviors, um, we've done some surveying and this is, I'll admit a little bit apples to oranges. This is comparing um, observed behavior pre-pandemic to what folks are telling us they expect they will do post-pandemic. Um, so keep that in mind. We're not post-pandemic yet, so we, we can't tailor this to observe behavior. I, I know that Nico's sort of struggled with, with some of that as well in, in his research, but um, I think this really underscores a point that Nico eloquently made earlier that we're getting less peaky. Um, we're, we're seeing a reduction in the number of folks who expect that they will be driving to work five days a week or more. Um, and a lot of that we think is explained by telecommuting um, and other forms of transportation. We're also seeing an increase in the number of people who expect that they will walk or ride a bike um, three or more days a week. And so that has some potential big implications for um, split week commuting patterns, for things like safety, equity, multimodal choices, um, even small shifts in that the overall number of folks who are commuting to work in a car five days a week could really influence kind of peak hour volumes and then unlock um, some new opportunities in how we allocate our roadway space. And again, Nico and David made this point that if, if we sort of free ourselves from having to design to peak hour, and um, this is a, a revelation and, and sort of a wake up call for um, those of us that are still doing that, that really helps us to potentially unlock some of these opportunities. And then the last thing I'll mention is we've, we've done a little bit of polling around um, transit demand. We're, we're in the middle of um, also updating our, our transit system master plan. Um, and the early results on that is that, that regional demand um, remains strong for investment in transit um, within the Charlotte region. That's an area where we're still trying to understand and kind of parse out um, what that looks like for us over the next um, year to um, sort of long-term transit investment. So some early lessons for us, you, you saw the slides that kind of support these conclusions. Um, it, it has become really important to us to be very clear uh, with what we mean when we say transportation equity. And so we've defined it in these two ways. I mentioned them earlier, social and geographic equity and modal equity. And that has implications specifically for how we hope to invest limited transportation dollars in the future. Um, we also recognize and have some humility around the fact that um, supporting transportation equity has to be an iterative process. Uh, and I, again, I think this points back to some of the things that, that Nico mentioned, but we know we need to re-engage and check these conclusions as we um, work towards the conclusion of our plan and, and towards implementing our plan. So we're right now pivoting to phase two um, of our engagement. Um, we've got a couple of different things that we're gonna try um, to uncover maybe some themes that, that we haven't heard and, and hear some voices that we haven't heard in our earlier process. We're recommitting to these equity focus groups to try to um, talk to more folks that don't typically have a chance to engage in a planning process. Um, and then towards the end of this, we're gonna be going out to every um, council district. Um, that's partially a way for us to broaden our engagement. It's partially a way for us to make sure our council members are more familiar with the content of our plan as we get towards adoption. And then this is the last, the last slide. I, again, um, want to be humble about some of the things that we're still struggling with. Um, we have got some political complications we're trying to work through in terms of a potential countywide sales tax referendum that a mayoral task force has suggested the city and county should pursue. Um, the primary purpose of that would be to support um, light rail investment and other um, modes of transportation. Um, there's been some regional conversations, some, some pro, some con around that, as you can imagine. Um, just to even get to a referendum, we'd have to get uh, support from our North Carolina General Assembly, which has historically been um, a very conservative and um, not necessarily supportive of um, large cities. Um, to uh, agree to let us to take that issue to voters. And then beyond that, um, I, I'm curious to know if other cities are in this situation. We are um, struggling right now with delays in census reporting and redistricting, which may result in us postponing our 2021 elections until 2022. And so we're sort of in this limbo around elected leadership 
around a potential funding referendum. And of course, the plan that we have to prepare needs to work with or without a successful referendum, with or without new city council members in place. Um, so that's just some more disruption that we have to look forward to. Um, I'd love to get others' thoughts on this. And uh, with that, Gene, I'll leave it to you to shepherd us into the next part of our agenda. Great, thank you so much, Scott. Um, well, you know, this has been so interesting to hear the different ways um, that each of you have um, really worked to respond to changes and disruption that have differed a little in each of your cities. And we've had some great discussion in the chat. I wanna start with a question that I think um, will capture some of the comments we've heard. Um, and I wanna hear from each of you and then have Nico and David um, have a chance to chime in too. There's interest in how you may be able to sustain the new processes, kind of the faster decision making that you've been able to put in place out of necessity in the last year. How is that sustained beyond a state of emergency when there's you know a different layer of reasoning that's helped push that forward? And just um, for each of you, you know, part of sustaining that is, you know, um, Warren, you mentioned that it was critical to your success that you had leadership from multiple departments kind of weighing in on some of that fast decision making. You know, how does that scale and sustain itself? And Julianne mentioned this really being a shift towards being more in the community and recognizing the importance of that. You know, how does that scale and how does that sustain itself in the new process? Nick talked about some of the longer term goals that Portland's program was working to serve around health and safety and business success. How do you translate from the short term experience to really continuing to tie it to those longer term goals? And Scott, same with you, it's sustaining this beyond this one process where you're going to continue to experience more of these iterative changes and uncertainty moving forward. Um, how does that play out? So I'll start with you, Warren, if you can um, give your thoughts. Sure. <laughs> I'm going to try and answer all of those questions at once. So uh, one of the, uh, I'll kind of go down the list. One is the reason that I think we found a lot of success was not only did we have senior leadership in the, in the community resilience team, we also had some very clear direction from the mayor's office and the mayor's policy director to just say, like, you're going to do this. And I think that one of the things that government is very good at doing, and I think we all might agree with this, is that we pick apart all of the different ways that something can go wrong and then decide eventually to not do anything. And that's not a good way to do work, right? Like by, by extension, by telling folks, we have to do something that, and I said this in the chat, the no build option is not an option forces people to kind of jump forward beyond the like, if I stay right here, we're safe, right? And especially for our fire department, they understood in the case of parklets and street closures, they're like, we can't be the reason why this doesn't move forward because then it's gonna be like the fire department kept the businesses from reopening, right? Like that, that was at least like clicking in their minds, which is very helpful. Moving forward and kind of answering your later questions, Gene, about like how you sustain this effort and I kind of mentioned this in my last slide, right, where we transition from city does everything to city trains the trainers to, to do the thing that we, that we all share in doing, right? And, and I think that that is a really interesting model that you wouldn't expect from a very progressive city. Like it's, I'm finding myself often saying like, government should get out of the way. And like, that's usually a conservative talking point, which I think is kind of funny. Um, but I think the critical difference is not just get government out of the way, it's government should enable and train community groups to then iterate on, on the designs that they can best serve their community. The other part is that in the case of permitting, our, our sort of perennial word for how government interacts with community groups, is to create a threshold or a sandbox that we will allow, right? And then everyone can play within that versus you can do this one thing, and if you don't do that, or you want to do something else, then we have to start over. And that is a, a paradigm that, fortunately, my, my staff don't have time to play in. So by saying, you can do all this and anything lower, go ahead, has been really helpful. Great. Julianne? 
Yeah, so um, that is a tricky question because I think in some ways, you know, we did some of the safe street stuff uh, that we heard about uh, today and people are tired, right? It took a lot of effort and energy. And so just in terms of staff willingness to like keep in that emergency mode, it's pretty rough. Um, but what I will say is we've talked about a couple of different strategies that I think are getting traction um, at a higher level. One is um, the creation of, of pods, if you will. Um, it's like the theme with the pandemic um, where we have these interdisciplinary groups um, that really reside in a geography of the city. And so they're there and they're a presence on a regular basis, not at our own events, but at events that the community is, is hosting. Um, and so that kind of being there, just being there, building the relationship, becoming familiar, having um, a common set of people instead of it's a new city person that doesn't even know what this other city person said or did in their community a week ago. Um, our hope is that you know, we create a more holistic approach as well as building those relationships. Um, in terms of the transportation division of ours, and we're a very, very fragmented uh, city, structurally speaking. Um, but that being said, the transportation div division tends to be the entrepreneurial group. And so new initiatives are often pushed by us. Um, it, it can be a burden because people end up working super hard, right? If it's your idea, you do it is sort of the, the attitude, but one of the things that we're looking at is completely reorganizing our space when we go back to the office. And so essentially we'll have co collaboration spaces, we'll have workstations that people can use on the days that they're not working from home. Um, and then we'll have spaces that are reserved for people from other divisions and departments of the city so that we can swap um, on particular days and just be in it and see what they're experiencing, what challenges they're facing um, such that the hope is that, again, that decision making that Warren was talking about, you know, leadership is pretty supportive of that right now. Um, and I think that getting a full staff understanding of everybody's challenges and strengths will help us do better in that regard and have things move a little more quickly. Nick, would you chime in? Yeah, you know, I, Peabot, we've had a lot of these policies and programs for a while. And you know, we've had programs for street plazas and street seats, but they weren't really well used. They were a little overly cumbersome, overcomplicated. And this, this crisis response really in every regard forced us to really think about what the minimum build was of these interventions. What is the least we can do to achieve what these goals are, whether that's slow streets or these painted curb extensions or some of our plaza permitting. Um, and it really cut through a lot of the nonsense so we could like make stuff happen and, and it has happened. And so I think there's just real, people have seen the value in that. And so they're trying to figure out how do we fold this into our longer programs? I don't know if it's gonna be quite as simple as and, and no nonsense as it was during this crisis, but I think that everyone sees the value in being able to deliver quickly, get those benefits today rather than tomorrow and to you know, help people embrace these tools. So. Uh, we see the value in it, uh, and uh, we're just, actually we're having those conversations right now. How do we transfer this into our long-range uh, systems? Yeah, Scott. Yeah, so for my part, I'd say our, our leadership has been very supportive. Um, the recognition that the way we invest in our transportation system now is, is not keeping up with our growth and is not equipping us for our mobility future that I mean that that's coming straight from our mayor um, and our city manager and so having that sort of support the fact that the mayor um, took it on herself to appoint a, a task force to, to guide our early process um, was big for us um, the other thing that I think has helped us a lot is um, we're following the comprehensive plan effort and so the comp plan's already been out in front doing a lot of this good work around engagement um, I mentioned those spatial patterns of inequity that are, are, have become a real focus of our entire citywide planning effort. Um, the comp plan, uh, those are the folks that really uncovered that and, and described it in a way that became resonant for our, our community. And so we've benefited from a lot of their good work. Um, and I, I suspect that that is something that will continue to be resonant moving forward. It's, it's become a real theme 
underlying all of the planning efforts that I, I mentioned um, up front. Great. Nico, you want to chime yes. in? Yes. Oh, my God. I love this conversation. I love these presentations. <laughs> um, I mean, and this, this is a really interesting conversation that we had as we were preparing for all this as well. Uh, everyone more or less said, um, you know, high touch is hard. It's exhausting, right? It takes a lot of time uh, and it might be hard to scale. Uh, and uh, so, you know, this, this thing that we were all able to do is this in, intense kind of moment. How do you, what's the future of that? And, and I have to say, I love the answers that all the cities are coming up with, right? There, there's a whole lot of like talking about how you um, have relinquish control in a way that you're saying, I don't need this exact thing, but you know, within this is okay. I think Warren's uh, um, uh, kind of description of that was, was fantastic. And uh, what Nick said, you know, what's the minimum we can build to make stuff happen? Like that is like that is such a different attitude from government, right? That is like such a that to me that is the shift like happening in real time. And one thing that I think is really interesting to point out as well, the the thing that that uh, Warren was saying, right, of like you know uh, trying to empower communities, like train the trainers, all this, right? Uh, it turns out that that completely aligns with all the stuff that we're that we're learning needs to happen for equity to happen, right? Like get it, like giving away some of the control. And the really nice thing I think that we're seeing in a lot of the examples that we just talked about is it's not a whole free for all like, okay, I guess like we don't know what, what's happening. You, we're giving you everything. You're saying instead of being super tight about this, you're expanding what's possible and letting people work without that. And, and it changes the role of the city to almost be as a catalyst and enabler, right? Not, not just a doer, right? And not just, not just a, a, a regulator, right? You are like helping enable these other things. This is I, it, it's, it's been really fun to have the conversations with all the cities over these last God, months now to really see a shift in like how, I mean, it, it is becoming like tangible. Like the, there's like, I think ongoing uh, um, uh, more permanent changes to how the cities are thinking. David, are you seeing similar, uh, you know, capacity to sustain in the transit realm? I think jury's still out. I mean, I think there's two factors that are, well, that are related to each other. One is popularity. If something's popular, uh, you know, if a pilot, that, you know, and I think the, uh, they did a lot of, uh, when uh, in the Bloomberg administration here, you know, that, oh, well, we're just going to pilot this. And then, of course, it's enormously popular. And nobody wants to take it away. But the other part of it is, is leadership. And, and so we see that as very important. And when something's popular, it makes it obviously easier for leadership. Uh, and so, for example, when, uh, you know, I mentioned San Francisco Muni and there re when you have a really resolute mayor, like Mayor London Breed in the appointments she's made to the Muni board and her leadership in the pandemic is like, we are doing this. And when you have a charismatic transportation commissioner like Jeff Tumlin, who is the commissioner, uh, you know, for, for controls the streets in Muni, and he, he's out there all the time saying, look, this is what we're doing, and including, including bad news. I mean, he had to tell wealthier neighborhood, you know, we're taking your bus service away because we have only so many drivers because we have so many on sick leave and we got to put them over here on these routes. So that's a case where leadership is actually helpful in doing something that is temp at least temporarily unpopular. Absolutely. I am going to ask, we had a question here that, um, is specific to some of what we're describing of distributing power and really enabling others in the community. Um, are you testing out any new mechanisms for providing payment to community-based organizations or community participants in this broader process? Has that been feasible, something that's been prioritized in a new way? You know, I can take that real quickly just from our experience. I, I mentioned that, um, especially as a part of those equity focus groups, um, paid participation is something that became important to us. We just made that a part of the um, consultant contract expectation. Um, so the consultants had a public engagement plan and it needed to include paid participation for these types of focus groups. And, and in that way, sort of passed it on to them and made it clear that that, that was something we needed to do. We did the same thing. I, I love that idea, Scott. So one of the challenges that we're finding is that, you know, we can bake our, our project teams to include, you know, CBO participation. The issue though is that I can't remember, maybe it was Nico or maybe it was Nick. One of one of us mentioned that 
that doesn't build trust with the community. Like, and this is the challenge that I think Oakland's running into, especially is that when you only engage about a specific project, then like all of those lessons learned just sort of stick to that project. Whereas having, oh, it was Julianne, because you're talking about um, neighborhood specific engagement, right? That that's the thing that we're trying to build that is sort of divorced from project specific engagement and developing long-term relationships. We have a couple of different ways that we're trying that out at like literally as we speak, which is one using our um, Oakland Fund for Public Innovation. The, the mayor started a, a separate philanthropy group that has a mayor's fund effectively that channels all of the philanthropic dollars that we receive and we can direct where that money goes and it just makes it a lot easier to pay CBOs directly. So that's, that's option one. The second is back to my train the trainer is that for the cultural markets, we can issue you know, up to certain amounts of like direct payments to an organization that then can pay each individual merchant underneath that. So we're just playing around with a couple of different options. But ultimately at the end of the day, our contracting needs to be streamlined so that we can pay the people who we are trying to pay while also avoiding the historic concerns of government corruption, I guess. Great. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then we're going to shift over to our breakout groups. Um, I really appreciated one comment. I think this must have been something Scott said of freeing ourselves from designing around peak hour. And I'm curious your thoughts on, are, are we there? Have we arrived at this point where peak hour is not really determining all of their decisions of, of right of way and how infrastructure and, and services applied? And, if so, you know, how does that fit within this framework of plan, pilot, evaluate, and pivot? How are we going to um, shift in that direction? What implications do you see it having? Or, or pushback? <laughs> I won't speak for the, the other cities. Um, I'll just acknowledge that no, we're, we're not there. I mean, we're in the city of Charlotte. It's easy for me to say that, but there's 8,000 city employees um, who work for the city of Charlotte who have different perspectives on this. And Sometimes I feel a little bit like, um, you know, the memes, what my mom thinks I do, what I really do. I, I think there's a meme out there somewhere that's about how we think we do transportation planning and what we really do. I, I, I think that we think um, we start with vision zero, safety, designing for livable communities. I think in a lot of cases, what we really do is look at the traffic model and say, how many cars per hour do we need to move? And then how do we try to keep people safe and livable within that? And we're still struggling, I think, to flip that. Um, no matter how many times, you know, planners within the organization might say it, 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 it's still a struggle to make it true. You know, I think that the transit industry is probably further along in that evolution than the infrastructure providers, particularly state, you know, highway departments that are so wedded to LOS and, and, and peak. Uh, you know, volume over capacity. But for a transit agency, there actually is a financial, you know, the, the um, you know, asset utilization to, you know, to purchase a, you know, if a quarter of your bus fleet is only being used like four hours a day, that's not a very good investment. And the complexities of split shifts on labor uh, also, you know, not, not so good. So I think, I think with transit agencies, there's, there, there is that self-interest in recognizing a less peaky world is a good thing. Uh, I, I want to jump in on the earlier one too, the Warren. I really like Warren talking about community-based organizations. I'll give you one from the transit world, which is Metro Transit, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Twin Cities region, and the work they do on locating bus stops and uh, the engagement on a professional basis with community-based groups. But blending that with good data, because you can't do it entirely on anecdote, um, and, and it's not always the loudest voices, and even community-based organizations that purport to be community-based, you know, there's, there's got to be some data validation on some of it. So they use census data, ridership data, combined with lived experience insights from groups. I'm deciding, and, and specifically about deciding where a shelter should be, if you have where what the best locations for bus shelters is. So there's an example if you'd like to look at. Great. Fantastic discussion. I wish we could continue to talk about this, um, but we hope that um, 
there'll be some good discussion among you all. So we've structured this to have just about uh, 15 or so minutes in a breakout group to talk a little more in depth. Um, our thinking is that one of you in your group will share a project or plan that, or, that you are working on right now that's facing or likely to face um, a disruption or, or some kind of new uncertainties that you're grappling with. And your group can just uh, talk about some of the um, tools for thinking differently and uh, piloting new approaches and evaluating and pivoting. Um, and to keep this concise, we're asking you to share your story. One of you um, share a story that the group can discuss as if you are on the elevator and your mayor has just stepped on the elevator and she looks over at you and she says, hey, how's your project going? And you have to respond. Warren shared that this was one exact experience he had when they were launching Slow Streets and getting tons of feedback about the first run of that. And you're in that moment of communicating, here's what we're hearing, here's how it's going, and here's what we need to change. So with that, you're, you should each, uh, each breakout group should have one of our panelists um, as your helper, but this is really informal discussion to walk through um, these examples. And I will be honest, this is my first time creating breakout rooms. So we will see how this goes. Okay. We've got faith in you, Jane. Um, oh, okay. I've got, I've got you all assigned and let me make sure you each have a person. Oh man, Zoom automatically put a co-host in each session. Okay, I'm gonna open the rooms. Um, if you have any issues, the chat window, I guess, to let me know. Um, you'll get a one minute warning when it's time to come back. And we're gonna ask um, your panelists that was part of your group to share some last minute insights based on what you discussed um, or the session overall. So with that, we will see you back here in a moment. Yay, we did it. <laughs> You're back. Well, I jumped in on a couple of your rooms. It seemed like everything worked like it was supposed to. And we have a few minutes left to wrap up. And we wanted this time to um, hear from you if you'd like. We certainly want to um, hear from our panelists with um, quick takeaways. You know, not really looking to rehash the project you discussed in your group or all of the ideas you came up with, but really want to hear some of the aha moments. And was there anything that came out of your group that really would um, benefit others to hear some of the key takeaways? And I'll start by calling on each of the panelists. And um, if you want to add your own comments in the chat window or raise your hand um, with your little raise your hand icon, you're welcome to. Um, Julianne, I see you up in the corner. Do you have any final thoughts and any um, major takeaways from your breakout group to share? Yeah, so um, I think with our discussion, the thing that jumped out um, to me most was, you know, in trying to uh, help with the endurance of change or help respond to things a little more quickly. Um, you know, finding a champion um, was a big theme that we talked about, but in particular, tapping into what already exists as far as your master plans of the city, for example. Um, and if there are practices that directly contradict those things or get in the way of those things, um, frame it that way and try and knock down the barriers. Yeah. Um, let's see, Nick. Can you share some of what you all discussed? Were you and Scott in the same group? Was yeah, Scott right? joined my group. We had a small group um, with a good discussion, kind of bouncing around a little bit. And it, we kind of ended Great. starting to reflect on some of the tactical urbanism type quick build projects and, and what that can really do to um, kind of really just changing the conversation, not just show people what the future might be or inspire people about what the future might be, but just fundamentally changing that dynamic and um, as far as that relationship. And that I was, I was starting to rant a little bit about how, you know, as a planner, I'm getting really sick of like doing a planning project for a couple of years, uh, waiting a couple more years for funding, and then trying to implement a project that can only isn't even what we were promising. 
and how we really build a framework of broken promises and broken relationships and that things like tactical, tactical urbanism you know, can, can maybe undo some of that where you're able to bring something to the community, ask them what they want, deliver on that very quickly and do it again and do it again. And it's about making promises and keeping promises that you start to build relationships. And um, I think really a lot of the work uh, Warren's been doing uh, in Oakland has really lived up to that in a very inspiring way. Absolutely. Scott, do you want to add anything to make takeaways or your own takeaways from this session? I, I think the point Nick just made was was beautifully made. And it's it's something that I've been struggling with a little bit because this our planning process is a long range process, right? In the midst of of all this disruption. And so we still need to figure out how we're going to deliver this long term plan for major community investment that in a way that feels tangible to folks. Um, and I, I don't know that we've really figured that out. My, my hope is that the investment that we've made in our engagement process and, and just trying to be honest and open about these things um, helps us to do that. I, I'm also just a couple of things maybe that will stick with me from the session. Um, I, I love the point that has been made that our cities are not our office space and they're not our commutes. And the fact that those things are changing does not mean that urbanism is going away. Um, again, this idea that even small changes in commuting patterns can unlock big changes in our use of public space, um, I think makes me hopeful for a post-pandemic reality. Great. Warren, any additional thoughts from you from the session or from your group? Sure, and Joshua, you're off the hook. I was about to text you. To you. I thought we're going to assign people. I was like, great, Josh is on the hook. Um, you know, what <laughs> I was reading the notes that you shared with us. Uh, so, you know, thank you to my group for kind of sharing a lot of their projects. Some of the things that we talked about, again, were sort of echoing the importance of leadership and how to sustain that leadership moving forward, um, which is not just about staff, right, but then about the leaders as well, kind of continuing to push. Another issue that we kind of addressed was about scaling these projects, right? You know, in, in our broader conversation, we've talked about individual pilots, but then how do they scale both in terms of staff capacity, leadership capacity, and then by extension, I think, Nick, you just mentioned this, like keeping the community engaged during that effort, you know, long-term is um, tiring and, and resource intensive. Uh, the other part was about Oh no, those were the two major feedback areas. I, I think we covered a lot of different ground in that um, conversation for sure. Great. And David, I think you had a separate group. Any final thoughts or big aha moments from your discussion? Sure. Uh, well, Verada from San Mateo uh, works in transportation demand management and she was talking about the incentives and rewards in terms of the absence of metrics around equity. I don't mean to, I, I can paraphrase, she can speak for herself better than I can, but the group discussion was around if you're not measuring something or if the powers that be aren't saying we want to measure X, Y, or Z, then X, Y, or Z probably doesn't happen. And that that's a political process in part, not just, a, it's in part technical, but part political. Yeah, Brad, it not to put you on the spot, but if you want to unmute, mute, you're welcome to chime in and share a little bit more about the discussion. Um, I would just add that like there's just so much energy and momentum around it. Our board is elected city officials, mm -hmm. and it's I, I'm just noting the the lag. I, I see there's like a delay in that people want stuff to happen, and and there's actually not a lack of alignment. I don't think there might be like you know, misalignments about what to do, but there's not a lack of alignment that we should be doing this. But then it, I was just saying the, the analogy I used, it's like, until it's something that we've uh, identified our priorities for and metrics for, it, it, it'll be something that we wanna do because it's like our extracurricular activity, but it's not like the real report card, you know, we're, and we're, we're graded on scale and volume, you know, like how many cars are off the road vehicle miles traveled and, and it's like, well, yeah, then we're going to go for all the big tech companies if that's the measure. Um, but then that that actually undercut, it's actually at cross purposes with equity because if there are all these diverse communities that have different needs, 
but if we're being graded on volume and scale, it, it's kind of like this. It's not even just like, oh, here add an equity metric. It's like our resources then get you know, bifurcated and radiate out in weird ways. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. It's great insight. Nico, I want to let you chime in too. I don't know which group you were in, but feel free to give your final thoughts on this session too. Uh, I was in Julianne's group. Um, I'll just say that the, it was really interesting, the conversation about um, uh, it seems both everyone in the group that we, are, that we were in talked about how cities are feeling a little less risk averse overall, like people are willing to take on some things, but that's uh, segmented, right? They're less risk averse in like allowing you to do some use some part of the street, but you know, and all of a sudden, like you know, paying community members, that's got all sorts of barriers, and no one's willing to take on the risk uh, to make that make that happen. Uh, and so, like, really made clear the the need one to get leadership on board, and two that it's going to take on the one hand leveraging maybe some of the some of the the things that are loosening up in one area to try to ha make it happen in another area. But that it's it is not uh, it's not universally being applied across cities, right? And also the yeah. you know someone made a really good comment in our session of uh, uh, my city manager is an accountant, former accountant. It is really hard to to get the you know this really leadership matters. Leadership matters. And I thought the comment before we heard of like you know Jeff Tumlin being able to communicate well and uh, and you know willing to take on risk makes a huge difference. Uh, these things really matter. Yeah, that is so true. We are at time and I'll just offer my own note that really appreciate the engagement of all of you and the fantastic uh, content from our presenters. And I know for me, this, you know, the last year has had a lot of tragedy for the country, for cities. There's been a lot of really hard things to experience, but I am really encouraged to have this kind of forum and an opportunity to really be thinking about you know, what, what good can come out of um, a lot of really difficult situations and to really be talking actively about what's to come next and how we can um, make change for the better. So I appreciate you all being a part of that conversation and hope you'll be joining in the rest of Urbanism Next uh, in the next couple of days. Thank you all. Thanks so much. Great session. Thank you.